I'm here squinting in windy San Diego, California with the Coronado Bay Bridge here behind me in what they call America's finest city. I'm starting my vlog series on the book called The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. It's a book that has historical events, anecdotes, quotes about power and the interpretations of them by Greene. For each law, Greene talks about or tells stories that show the observance of the law, that shows and or the transgression of it, and the reversals of the law. So for each vlog, I'll be going over the stories, the quotes, the anecdotes that he puts in the book, sometimes about the observance of the law, sometimes about the reversal, and or I'll just have them all and talk about as well as the transgressions of them. It's a book considered by some to be a bit dark, Machiavellian, too thirsty and hungry for power. And it's true to an extent, but what's really interesting was the back of the book, and I feel is a saving grace for it, is where it says, this is a book for those obviously who want power, those who watch it, and those who want to arm themselves against it, and those seeking power. So let's get into it. Law number one, never outshine the master. Always make those above you feel comfortably superior. In your desire to please or impress them, do not go too far in displaying your talents or you might accomplish the opposite, inspire fear and insecurity. Make your masters appear more brilliant than they are and you will attain the heights of power. With this law, Green tells two different stories that shows this law in work, one that observes the law and another that transgresses it. He starts with Nicholas Fouquet, Louis XIV's finance minister who sadly outshone the master unintentionally. Fouquet was a man of exquisite taste, fantastic parties, a beautiful chateau, and lovely women. When the prime minister died, Fouquet immediately thought that Louis would appoint him for the vacant post, but the king unexpectedly got rid of the position. Fouquet had a suspicion that he had fallen out of favor with Louis. In order to mend the situation, Fouquet, being a man of money and class, thought that throwing a party in honor of Louis XIV would be a good way to earn his favor once again. The party was extraordinarily superb, with a who's who of guests. Foods from Asia that had never been eaten in France, marvelous gardens, a firework display, and a play that was written just for the evening. The consensus was the gala was the most spectacular party ever experienced by the guests. The next day, Fouquet was arrested on bogus charges and sent to an isolated prison in France where he lived the rest of his life in solitary confinement. Oh, how the tables can turn. Fouquet thought he was honoring the king, but in fact, all he did was secretly infuriate a man who wanted all eyes upon himself. After Fouquet, Louis appointed Jean-Baptiste to be the finance minister, a man known to be cheap who threw boring parties. Additionally, Fouquet's magnificent chateau where he held the party for the king was surpassed by Louis's palace in grandeur when built, <laughs> the Palace of Versailles. The gala did not display his loyalty to the king. It just made Louis feel insecure about his own power and position with the people. Making Louis XIV doubt his own grandness proved to be Fouquet's demise. But a person who nailed this law on the head was Italy's own Galileo. In order to fund their research, scientists like Galileo would make gifts of their inventions and discoveries for the wealthy of the time. Unfortunately, Galileo's patrons typically paid him in gifts and not money. And as you know, <laughs> gifts don't pay the bills cold hard cash does. So for his next discovery of Jupiter's moons, Galileo brilliantly showed that the heavens were in alignment with the rise of the Medicis, the powerful Italian banking and political family of Florence. They were absolutely sold. He was made the official court philosopher and mathematician, and most importantly, he was given a full salary. Galileo no longer had to search for wealthy customers. As Green put it, he did not outshine the master. He made the master outshine all others. A thing you need to know about these kinds of people, like the heads of state or leaders, kings, is that some of them are insecure, so even being your natural self can bring about jealousy and envy in your superiors. These individuals of prominent standing want to feel secure, not insecure, and grander than those around them. So be careful to not surpass them. In not outshining your master, Green says, quote, flatter and puff up your master. Discreet flattery is much more powerful. If you are more intelligent than your master, for example, seem the opposite. Make him appear more intelligent than you. Act naive. Make it seem that you need his expertise. Commit harmless mistakes that will not hurt you in the long run, but will give you the chance to ask for his help. Masters adore such requests. 
If your ideas are better than the master's, give the credit to him and say that your idea is simply a copy of his idea. In the reversal of the law, Green mentions different situations. If your master is falling from grace, outshine him. If he is weak, quietly advance his collapse. If he is too weak and about to crumble, let it happen naturally because you do not want to look mean and cold-hearted. But if your superior has a strong position, be patient. It's natural for power to wane. When he falls that one day and you played it correctly, you will eventually take his place. My issue with this last piece of advice is what if, for example, your boss is amazing and young? Then what? You're going to wait 20 years for his position? This brings me to my point about all these kinds of books. It's all about context. These are bestsellers for a reason. They resonate and hold true in many situations. But it's your own accumulation of experience and true understanding of your scenario that should dictate your course of action, not some book rule in a vacuum. Life is dynamic and each event has its unique tray of variables. Do not be foolish to take books like these, laws, rules, or the like, as biblical scripture as many do. What may work for the author and many of its readers may not hold true for you. And another point I'd like to emphasize, your own nature. Some of these directives may be completely incongruous to your personality. But this law is a good one because <laughs> we've all seen it time and time again. Remember your brown-nosing classmate or coworker? He may naturally be like that, but some of them were actually cunning enough to put this law into practice. Your boss may be the head, but these types of individuals aim to be the neck that controls the head until they themselves become the head. I personally remember a co-worker being like this. <laughs> What's up, Brian? We despised him as he ascended in the company. Years later, I saw him randomly about and he said it was all a facade. He played the game, brown-nosed, rose through the ranks, left the company <laughs> after I got fired, and then joined another corporation where he was currently the youngest vice president. What we despised in Brian was actually brilliance in action. But to some, they could never stoop so low. And that's the thing about this book and all self-help, strategy, whatever you want to call it books. Use them to make the best you. And who knows the best you? You. So pick and choose or simply just leave some of the points made. This may be a dark book to some, but as I said in the beginning, at the least, it allows you to arm yourself against power or those seeking it. That's all for Law 1. Never outshine the master. And when you do, according to Green, you're able to attain some power. Signing out from San Diego in Southern California, or as we call it, SoCal, take care and be awesome. Peace.